Well, good afternoon, everyone. And it's really a pleasure to have all of you here today for this really tremendous occasion for the University of Chicago. My name is Derek Douglas, and I'm the Vice President for Civic Engagement at the University of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event today. Um, I'm going to be very brief because we have a terrific program of speakers and a panel. But there's one statistic that I did want to just um, provide, which I think gets to the heart of what we're here today to discuss. And that's according to a 2015 report from the Pell Institute for the Study of Opportunity in Higher Education and the Penn Alliance. 77% of adults from families in the top income quartile earned a bachelor's degree by the age of 24. And that's compared to only 9% of adults from the lowest income bracket. So if you think about just that statistic, you have a 70% gap between children from the highest income quartile going on to college, graduating from college versus lowest income brackets. Now the divide in education that that statistic symbolizes, and there's many others, um, I think is evident. But the challenge that that statistic puts to all of us today as an institution, the University of Chicago, but all of us as individuals, is what can we do? How can we rise up to try to meet that challenge and to close that divide? At the University of Chicago, um, this is an issue that has been on our minds for some time. And you, you'll hear from um, President Zimmer and others later about some of the programs and initiatives that we've initiated over the last several years to try to speak to or contribute to closing um, that divide. And I take your presence here today um, as a signal of this being an important issue to you as well. Over the course of the afternoon, though, in addition to hearing about some of the work at the University of Chicago and exciting new initiatives, we'll also hear from a distinguished panel who will talk about issues of diversity, inclusion, and equal access in higher education, things and strategies that we could use to try to address those issues. Um, and immediately afterwards, you will be invited to join a discussion as the panelists take some of your questions on these topics. But we're going to start by hearing from our president, Robert J. Zimmer. President Zimmer has been, he joined the University of Chicago in 1977. And but for a, a short stint at Brown University as provost, he's been here his whole career. And the last 10 years as president of the university. And I think over his time here, he's been able to pick up and have a deep understanding for the values of the University of Chicago, but also for this unique opportunity that a University of Chicago education presents. And what I've admired about him so much is that understanding the values and understanding the opportunities has been a driving force behind his commitment to ensure that no student would be denied this opportunity on the basis of income. And I think that it's a testament to the work and the leadership of President Zimmer that we're here today. And I invite you all to welcome him, the 13th president of the University of Chicago, Robert J. Zimmer. Uh, good afternoon. And thank you all uh, for joining us here today. Uh, as you've heard from Derek, uh, as a nation, we're faced every day and in every community with a critical question, namely, how do we ensure that hardworking students of exceptional promise, regardless of their economic circumstances, have full access to an empowering education? We've seen over and over again that such an education changes the lives and opportunities of individuals, changes the trajectory of families, and has the capacity to change for the better the fabric of our society. The insistence that a University of Chicago education should be open to all, independent of economic circumstances, has been an enduring value of the University of Chicago since its inception. It's been a value in human and societal terms, but it's also been critical to our own self-definition as a place of rigorous and open inquiry and discourse by a community of diverse backgrounds, perspectives, and views. From the university's beginning, we've offered full or partial scholarship assistance 
to undergraduates on a competitive merit basis. Since the 1980s, we've had a need-blind admissions policy which ensures that we admit students independent of need and provide financial support packages to enable them to attend. Even today, with access to education such an important national issue, there are only about three dozen universities and colleges in the entire country with this policy. But we were committed to do much more. In 2007, we introduced the Odyssey Scholarship Program, which allowed us to broaden this commitment by eliminating loans and work-study requirements for students with the greatest financial need. The Odyssey Scholarship Program was made possible by a $100 million gift from an anonymous donor known as Homer, who challenged the university to raise an endowment for this program of $150 million. Since then, more than 10,000 alumni, parents, families, and friends have contributed to the Odyssey program. And more than 3,500 students, many the first in their families to attend college, have been named Odyssey Scholars. Odyssey has become a national model for improving access for outstanding students from lower income backgrounds. In addition to providing scholarships, the university holds workshops for students and families on how to navigate the college admissions process, regardless of whether or not they attend the University of Chicago. We've eliminated barriers by streamlining our own admissions and financial aid application process and by eliminating application fees for lower income students. These efforts are complemented by the Collegiate Scholars Program, which is a University of Chicago program for Chicago public school students. The goal is to help prepare these students for admission and success at the most selective colleges and universities around the country. These initiatives are having a great impact. Of the nearly 500 alumni of the Collegiate Scholars Program, 70% have enrolled in the nation's most selective schools, including the University of Chicago, uh, Harvard, and Princeton. Many Odyssey scholars are among the college's top achievers, earning awards uh, such as Fulbright grants and National Science Foundation fellowships. Students who have benefited from the Odyssey program understand its value, and this is demonstrated by the fact that nearly 80% of Odyssey students and alumni give back to the university every year. But we remain committed to do yet more. Today, we announced the launch of a new $100 million enhancement of our programs that support lower income students with the potential for outstanding academic achievement. This enhancement is anchored by a new $50 million gift and challenge from writer Harriet Hyman, who graduated with a Master's of Arts degree from the Division of the Humanities in 1972, and her husband, Sir Michael Moritz, Chairman of Sequoia Capital. Harriet and Michael are committed to the idea that our most promising students must have opportunities to meet their fullest potential without impediments from financial barriers. Harriet, who grew up on the south side of Chicago and was a first generation college student, and Michael, who came to the United States on a student scholarship program, have made several major gifts supporting educational aid in the United States and the United Kingdom. Inspired by the success of Odyssey and the Collegiate Scholars Program, they are donating 50% of the new $100 million commitment and have challenged the university to raise the remaining $50 million through a new five-year Odyssey challenge. This will bring the university's total commitment to Odyssey to $350 million. 
Cultivating students' potential for exceptional achievement regardless of their ac economic circumstances has always been a central commitment of the University of Chicago. Harriet and Michael's transformative generosity reaffirms that principle and allows us to pursue an ambitious model of support for students of underrepresented backgrounds. We are deeply grateful for their action on this vital issue. Now, Harriet is not able to join us today, but we will hear from Sir Michael Moritz later in the program. Uh, but now, I would like to introduce uh, John Boyer, Dean of the College, who will tell you more about the enhancements that this tr transformative gift makes possible. Thank you very much. We announced today a major new initiative in the college in support of students from low-income and first-generation family backgrounds. With the far-sighted support of Harriet Hyman and Sir Michael, Sir Michael Moritz, we will invest major new resources in the university's Collegiate Scholars Program and the college's Odyssey Scholarship Program, confident that, we, uh, that this support will be matched, even exceeded by many thousands of our alumni over the next five years. The purpose of our initiative is threefold. First, it will support and expand the work of our Collegiate Scholars Program, which each year assists many dozens of talented Chicago public high school students in preparing for and gaining acceptance at leading colleges throughout the United States, including our own college. Second, it will further strengthen the financial resources needed to eliminate student loans and provide robust academic mentoring programs for our Odyssey Scholarship recipients while they're at the college. And third, it will build into the Odyssey program major new foundational systems to help our students engage in wise and effective career planning and to achieve successful career outcomes. The logic of what we aim to do is simple, to respond to the challenges and to the opportunities faced by talented students from low and modest income backgrounds by creating what I would call a holistic system of support and encouragement accompanying the beginning, the middle, and the end of a student's career in the college. We want our students to encounter no barriers in applying for the college. We want them to experience robust academic support systems while at the college and to graduate free of debt. And we want, them to, we want to help them prepare themselves to attain high levels of professional success over the course of their adult lives. Chicago scholarship programs go back to the origins of the university. In the 1890s, our first president, William Rainey Harper, established scholarships for undergraduates who were among the most talented in their high school classes, starting with a scholarship for a top student from each of Chicago's high schools and other schools in the region with which the university had a special relationship. Harper was deeply, deeply concerned that we recruit academically gifted students regardless of family resources, and this was at the very beginning of our history. In 1897, he dreamed of the day when we could offer 100 such scholarships to students from Chicago. As he put it, quote, how small a thing, how small a thing this would be, and yet how tremendously significant in the lives of the hundred for whom such provision would thus have been made, end quote. And the university organized such scholarships for two primary reasons. First, to signify our gratitude to the people of the city of Chicago for helping us create this great university, but also, secondly, to enable us to recruit particularly talented students with strong academic interests who would then help to shape the university's new academic identity. And in the university's early decades, the devotion of our undergraduate students to intellectual seriousness marked it as a place apart in the world of American higher education. With such students as partners, the faculty could then create an extraordinary learning community, stressing both the intrinsic power of the liberal arts and the efficacy of the best possible professional education. The educational ambitions of our students were met by a variety of pathways. Indeed, the early history of Chicago not only demonstrated a stunning intellectual engagement with the liberal arts and with the revolutionary programs of general education, what we would today call the core curriculum, which at the time were particularly intense and thought-provoking forms of learning, but Chicago also inserted into the undergraduate educational program, um, inserted it all over the university, and included bridge programs to professional education in business, law, and medicine. As a major research university set in a large urban metropolis and serving the personal and professional needs of a wide diversity of students, the majority of whom were commuters who lived at home or elsewhere in the city, there was little chance of a collegiate tradition 
developing at the university, which would tightly circumscribe our college from the rest of the university. And this was very, a very unique feature of Chicago, very different from the schools with which it was competing in the East. There, the boundary between the undergraduate college and the rest of the university was, was, uh, was very low, if not non-existent at Chicago. Coming from a wide diversity of um, cultural perspectives and socioeconomic classes, our students reaffirmed the values of merit and self-achievement, which in turn helped to produce a student academic culture that had strong affinities with that of the faculty. To the extent that the university quickly developed a robust dedication to academic freedom and integrity of argument, I think this owed a great deal to the dedication and to the diversity of perspectives of our students and not simply to the a priori values brought by our faculty. And the faculty in turn saw the teaching of these students as integral to the core mission of our university, not as an occasional or trivial service, but as a mission to engender a wider, wider milieu of scholarly values among the students, intellectual engagement, dispassion in the midst of controversy, and courage in the face of intellectual uncertainty. And thus the teaching of our undergraduates became constitutive of the university's fundamental mission and, 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 and calling. And Chicago also quickly became a key agent in one of the larger eudemonistic functions shared by all the great American research universities, namely to serve as a motor of social and cultural mobility. It did this by, by raising funds from non-governmental civic sources, patrons from our alumni and other individuals and organizations in Chicago, around the nation, to establish scholarship endowments which enable the university to help still more worthy students join our community. Most recently, we've had the good fortune to have two major $100 initiatives. The first Odyssey Scholarship Program of 2008, in which we have matched with tens of millions of additional dollars over the last seven years, and the new initiative of a second $100 million for Odyssey, which we are announcing today. The willingness of our alumni and our friends who have profited from our system of higher education to give back to the university, to give back to our students in the form of scholarships, is, I think, a remarkable tribute to the social rationale of our system and to the conviction of our community about the importance of social mobility and cultural access for all. But, but the work that we do is important for reasons beyond social mobility. At our university, we pride ourselves in encouraging a style of learning that privileges autonomy, individual freedom, and personal responsibility. We do this not only for its own sake, but because we believe that our society needs thoughtful, creative people to take up the challenges of governing a highly complex civil society filled with people of different religious, class, ethnic, racial, and political backgrounds. We believe that our nation needs this kind of education for its leaders, that government must be informed and directed by the people rather than the people being told only what government thinks they should know or do. Our students will eventually take responsibility for our universities, for our schools, for our law firms, for our government offices, for our businesses, for our media, and for the medical schools of the future. Their generation has large social responsibilities in a society that is still rife with poverty, ignorance, joblessness, and fear. Such change requires enlightened leaders in all of the professions across our civil society, well-skilled and properly trained. Education such as ours helps free people from ignorance, fear, and indecision, but it also, in its social capaciousness, should teach profound lessons about the importance of tough-minded analysis, about tolerance of divergent thinking, and about respect for freedom of opinion. We count on our alumni and our faculty to articulate and to defend these complex values and thus to support and encourage our youngest members, our students. Their turn will soon come to do the same for those who come after them. Our students, with their idealism and ambition, make us realize how unique our community is. Our community is worth supporting, it is worth supporting, and in its commitment to cultural pluralism shaped by academic rigor, it is, worth, it is particularly worth celebrating. And in giving talented students from all socioeconomic experiences, all backgrounds, the opportunity to, to excel at Chicago, it seems to me we enrich our most fundamental mission, that of encouraging intellectual independence and creative freedom, a freedom that does add most to the dignity and to the value of human life. Thank you very much. And now it is my great honor to introduce our most generous benefactor who, together with Harriet Hyman, has made this wonderful gift and this wonderful day possible. Please join me in welcoming Sir Michael Mortz.
thank you. This is a uh, very generous, warm Chicago welcome. Thank you, uh, President Zimmer. Uh, thank you, Dean Boyer, for your gracious, uh, kind, and generous remarks. Uh, I was asked just to say a few words of, to answer the question of why. And it's very simple. Uh, Harriet, my wife, um, grew up very close to here uh, in a not very salubrious neighborhood. Um, her grandparents uh, were immigrants. They um, left school at the age of 14. Neither of her parents went to college. She, as President Zimmer said, uh, was a student of the Chicago public high school system and then came to the University of Chicago, which provided her the springboard and platform for everything that life has subsequently offered. Uh, I grew up in Wales. My parents were both refugees from Nazi Germany. Uh, both were sent by their parents, my grandparents, without any money to the safety of the United Kingdom in the 1930s. Where had it not been for the kindness of strangers and the generosity of others, neither of them would have been able to finish high school and my father would never have been able to go on uh, to study at university. And um, I, as uh, President Zimmer said, when I came to America uh, in the mid-1970s, um, I did so to a university whose uh, fees uh, my parents couldn't afford. And I would never have been able to um, come to America again without the benefit of receiving a um, wonderful scholarship uh, from people whom, at that point, um, I didn't know. So Harriet and I um, both think it's our turn um, to reciprocate and to thank the people who've helped our own family um, over the last several decades and can't think of a happier, better way to do it uh, than to a university, than to the University of Chicago that exemplifies um, everything that we really believe in, which is um, uh, turning a blind eye to the circumstances uh, of the individuals that apply here and marry that with a great um, devotion um, to excellence. And I also work in Amelia in Silicon Valley in California where many of the people who go on to do extraordinary things come from unlikely backgrounds. They're people who uh, were born in circumstances that were difficult and were tough. Frequently they were never given a chance of uh, potentially excelling, but they demonstrated real extraordinary virtues. They're indefatigable. They have a desire to excel. They're fighters. They persevere. They're tenacious. And those traits, I think, you will immediately recognize um, in the traits of the successful uh, individuals who make up um, the Odyssey program, which will, I'm confident, um, go from strength to strength. And finally, I'd like to say in these times where we're um, inundated with noisy messages, that there's no stronger force for good than the influence in society of the well-educated individual 
And today, through the Odyssey program, we're able to welcome more of those sorts of individuals um, into the lives of our society. And one last thought, which is this, that the real heroes of the afternoon aren't any of us necessarily sitting in this auditorium today. The real heroes are the people, the students in the Chicago high schools and other high schools around the country who eventually will gain admission um, to the Odyssey program and then eventually graduate with what will for them be a treasured possession, a University of Chicago degree. Thank you very much. It's um, now my pleasure to introduce Chloe S. Gillespie, uh, a student of the class of 2016. Uh, Chloe is the Frank Baker and Laura Day New Leaders Odyssey Scholar. She's a senior in the college, and she's been asked on behalf of her students, fellow students, to comment on her experiences in the Odyssey program. Chloe. Hi, my name is Chloe Gillespie, a fourth year and comparative human development major here at the university. Not only that, but I am a proud Chicago native raised right here on the south side of Chicago. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Before I start with any remarks, I must first thank God for the amazing opportunity to speak briefly on what the University of Chicago and the Odyssey program has done for me. I'd also like to thank my mother, who raised me with the love and prayer that prepared me for moments like this, where I could stand proudly before great men and women. I was first introduced to the University of Chicago through the College Bridge program, which allowed me to take college level courses while I was still in high school. After this amazing experience, I knew that I connected with the university on an academic level, but I wasn't quite sure of how the logistics of my education in college would work out. That's where the Odyssey Scholarship came in. When I think of what the Odyssey Scholarship has done for me over the past four years, similar to Dean Boyer, the word that comes to mind is freedom. Freedom in every way. See, where I'm from, who you are and what you become in the future is solely based on what you have right now and not having much made my future look pretty bleak. Now, of course, getting admitted to the University of Chicago was truly one of the greatest things that has happened to me, but getting that financial aid award letter, whew, was even better. <laughs> because of programs, <laughs> Because of programs like the Odyssey Scholarship, I was able to truly become a student. I was able to immerse myself in classes and explore my own interest. I was able to change my mind and then change it again to figure out exactly how I wanted to contribute to this world. And I was able to do this without worrying about impending loans. What's more is that I knew that my mother, I knew that my mother wouldn't have to carry any of my financial burdens which made my college experience so much better. The Odyssey program aided in my support and made the grounds of college for a first generational student so much more stable. What's even more encouraging is that amazing people like Harriet Hyman and Sir Michael Moritz, in addition to the 10,000 plus supporters of this program, are working to further this great legacy. So again, when I think of how the Odyssey Scholarship contributed to my college career, I think freedom. Not just for me when I'm sitting in class learning about theories of cultural psychiatry. I think about freedom for my mother so that she won't ever have to worry about the source of her livelihood ever again. I think about the freedom for my eight-year-old niece who will be able to venture outside of a four block radius. And lastly, I think about the freedom I'll help bring to my community through nonprofit organizations like homeless shelters and job resource centers that are sure to create opportunities, change lives, and give people the exact same freedom that I have been given. Thank you. The stories that Chloe provided, Sir Michael Moritz, 
um, our alum, Harriet Hyman. That's what this is all about. That's what the Odyssey scholarship is all about. That's what we're trying to do through collegiate scholars. And I don't think that the story of what we're trying to do could be told any better than what we heard today from the personal testimonies from Chloe and Sir Michael Moore. So one more round of applause for both of them, please. I also just wanted to say, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the Vice President for the Office of Civic Engagement, and we are also the beneficiaries of the, the, the graciousness and the gift of um, Ms. Hyman and Sir Michael Moritz for the Collegiate Scholars Program. I know in the audience somewhere there are some Collegiate Scholars here today. If they could just um, clap your hands so people know you're here. Um, the Collegiate Scholars Program has prepared over 400 Chicago Public School students in its history. And I'm proud to say 100% of the scholars in Collegiate Scholars Program went on to a four-year degree in college. So that's an amazing um, track record that we're very proud of. Um, but I think what the lesson of today is, and I'm transitioning now to the panel, is that while there's a great divide in this country and programs and initiatives like we heard today are helping to um, address those challenges and address those divides, the stakes are really high, not just for the University of Chicago, not just for the city of Chicago, but the country for us to figure out how we address this. If you don't have things like Odyssey scholarships, you may not have the story of Chloe Gillespie. You may not have the story of Harriet Hyman and the leadership that they're providing to their communities, to their families, to their nations, to their cities. So really figuring out how do we all come together, all sectors, the academic sector, the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, to address these issues I think is of paramount importance. And those are some of the questions that our distinguished panel is going to speak to today. So I want to introduce our moderator and then she will introduce the, the rest of the panel. Um, the moderator for today is Sarah Stalenga. Sarah is the Sarah Liston Spurlark Director of the Urban Education Institute, as well as a clinical professor on the Committee of Education. Her areas of expertise include school reform policy and history, organizational change in schools, leadership, and teacher effectiveness. So I'll now turn the program over to Sarah. Thank you. College access and attainment for our most disadvantaged students is among the most critical letter, lever that we have to reduce social inequality and to battle institutionalized racism. Although we've made progress on admission and graduation from college for low-income students of color at the University of Chicago, in the city of Chicago, and nationally, I think we can all agree we still have miles to go. In order to move the needle, in order to actually change the odds, we need diverse perspectives. We need diverse expertise. We need expertise and perspectives that span practice and policy, that span K-12 education and higher education. We need vision, innovation, and courageous voices. It is my pleasure to say that this evening on this panel, we have that diverse expertise. We have those perspectives. We have that courage represented in the stage. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists and to facilitate their conversation this evening. Just to say two things about the bios. One is that I want to be very brief so that you have more time to hear from the panelists. Um, and in doing so, I'm consolidating and not able to give you the flavor of all of the many accomplishments of the distinguished panelists. And so please forgive that. The second is to acknowledge up front the affiliation that all four of us have with the University of Chicago as alums. We represent the lab school, the college, master's programs, as well as doctoral programs. And so thank you on behalf of all of us to our alma mater. So starting with Arne Duncan. Arne Duncan, as you know, was named US Secretary of Education by President Barack Obama. He recently ended his term in December of 2015. Prior to that, Arne Duncan was the CEO of Chicago Public Schools from 2001 to 2008, becoming the longest serving big city education superintendent in the country. Prior to that, Duncan ran the Aerial Education Initiative, 
a nonprofit focused on advancing educational opportunities. And perhaps most importantly, from 1987 to 1991, Duncan played professional basketball in Australia, working with children who are wards of the state. Please join me in welcoming Arnie Duncan. To Arnie's left, we have Liz Kirby, the Chief of School Strategy and Planning for Chicago Public Schools. Liz has a long career in education in Chicago. She taught at the Olive Harvey Middle College and Triumphant Charter School and worked at Kenwood Academy first as a history teacher, an assistant principal, and then the principal, winning the Golden Apple Award as a teacher in her second year, a very distinguished honor. She holds a master's from Harvard and a master, excuse me, a bachelor's from Harvard and a master's degree from University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Liz Kirby. <laughs> and finally, to Liz's right, we have Vince Tinto. Vince is a distinguished university professor emeritus at Syracuse University and the former chair of the higher education program. He's carried out extensive research and written on higher education, on student success and the impact of learning communities, and on building institutional action for student success. His two books, Leaving College and Completing College, both published here at the University of Chicago Press, are considered to be the most important bench benchmark on understanding how to create institutional support for the types of students that we're talking about today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tinto. I think it's important for us to focus on both the challenges that we face, but also on the successes that we've had, both at the K-12 education level and at the higher education level relative to these issues. But we're going to start with the challenges. Um, and for each one of our panelists, can you please talk to us about what are the most pressing challenges that face us in terms of this critical issue of increasing access and attainment for our most, most disadvantaged students? Um, and can you just tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, from your lens, what are the most important challenges that we face, the barriers that we face? And I'm going to start with you, Arnie. I, I think it's all downhill after Sir Michael and Chloe. We should have all gone home. They said, <laughs> they said it all. But I think someone like Chloe, what we see is that talent is so much more evenly distributed than opportunity. And while she's an amazing young woman and she's going to go on to do amazing things, what kills me is there are so many young men and women like her who live 10 blocks, 12 blocks, two miles from here, who have never been on campus, who will never have these kinds of opportunities. And until we are serious about providing opportunity to everybody, to every community, we'll continue to leave far too much talent on the sidelines. So I'll just give you quickly the good news and the bad news on this and the sense of urgency that, that you hit on. The good news over the past 20 years is the number of black graduates from college has doubled. The good news is the number of Hispanic graduates have doubled over the past 20 years. The reality check is Hispanic college completion rates over the last 20 years have doubled from 8% to 15%. And the question I ask folks, do we want to stand here in 2035 and say we are heroes, now 30% of Hispanics are graduating from college. African American graduation rates have gone from 13% to 23%. And do we want to stand here and say we're almost at half? And so I think what we need, which the university and others are working so hard on, is a vision for exponential increases in opportunity, finding the many, many diamonds, unpolished diamonds, unrecognized diamonds like Chloe, and giving them the chance. And if we truly want to get at the issues of income inequality and the visions of class and race, the only way to do that is to, at scale, create opportunity for the kids and communities that forever, sure. for decades and decades and decades, have been denied those opportunities through no fault of their own. Thank you for that, Arnie. Liz, would, what would you add to that? You know, um, speaking from the perspective of um, a former teacher, principal, um, and a network chief, and in my capacity as a network chief prior to the chief role of strategy and planning, I oversaw the schools in Chicago and the Inglewood, Auburn, Gresham community, which you know, really um, is a community that is comprised primarily of students that are low income and African American. Um, chief challenges um, that we've seen is the preparedness of students um, to be ready to be successful um, in college. In the city of Chicago, we have done a lot of great work around getting students um, ready, ready to graduate from high school. So many people probably know of the on-track work, which started um, under the leadership of Arnie Duncan. 
Um, but now our focus really um, is shifting to um, B's or better work, really focusing on students earning high grade point averages, um, because the research shows that the higher the grade point average, mm. the higher the, um, the college retention and completion rates in particular. Um, currently, one in four um, eighth graders are leaving, and you know, the middle grades report is starting to track what's happening even in elementary schools. One in four eighth graders are leaving their elementary schools um, with the skills to, to be ready for um, success in high school and ultimately college completion. So if we just look at their profiles, we can predict um, that only 25% of our eighth graders are going, ha going to have the, the um, chance to complete college. Um, so in order for students to have a 50-50 chance of completing college, they need to have at least a 3.0 grade point average. Um, so preparedness, as when we look at the data of grade point averages, both for our eighth graders, but also grade point averages um, in our high schools, we are woefully behind where we need to be in order to really increase college uh, retention and completion rates. Um, so the preparedness piece is, is huge, I think, in terms of being a barrier. And that connects to other challenges, because if students aren't prepared, then they're not able to access opportunities like the Odyssey Scholarship to assist them in paying for school. Um, so students are either taking out very, very high uh, loans, um, and they're enrolling in schools that don't have great, great retention rates. So you have several, several challenges for students who passionately want to go to co want to go to college. Which, and I'm really excited in Chicago, because I really think that um, the goal of entering and completing. Co Completing college is something that um, the district has focused on and students are excited about. But without having the profile to uh, get into a school that is really going to adequately support students, both academically, socially, emotionally, and financially, um, the reality is many students are not, are not finishing and often um, leaving school in great debt. Um, so those are some, some of the challenges that we see um, that are happening for our students in, in the public school system. So we have a, a need for acceleration, um, to your point, Arnie, of actually moving the needle quicker than we're moving it. We have a preparation gap relative to students leaving with the necessary kind of framework and foundation that they need to be successful in college. We have selection uh, challenges in terms of them choosing institutions where they get the supports they need to graduate. Um, Vince, what would you add to that relative to the challenges that we face? Let me count the ways. Um, <laughs> Well, I think uh, for colleges, and let me just observe that my work has always been with individual institutions. I don't work at state policy levels. But it's pretty clear, <clears throat> excuse me, that access without opportunity, uh, support is not real opportunity. Right. That while we're able to provide access to many low-income, underrepresented students, unless we provide them adequate support, uh, it doesn't translate to real opportunity to graduate. Take, for example, academic skills. Uh, among students who graduate uh, high school with considered um, more than adequate skills for college, the top of their classes, uh, nearly 85% will graduate in time. Among those who are least well prepared, uh, at best no more than 20%. That's simply unacceptable. And therefore, colleges, especially two-year colleges, but many other colleges, struggle with providing sufficient academic support to students whose academic skills need help. And there are many. Uh, that is also challenged by the fact that institutions don't have resources, human or financial, to address these issues at scale. And therefore, the third issue is how to scale this up. Now, none of this is to say that colleges <clears throat> and universities haven't been attentive to the question. There's a range of reforms going on in revising developmental education, providing different types of support structures for new, new students. The challenge is too often these programs, because of resource limitations, end up being uh, what we call boutique programs. They may serve 25 students here, 30 students there, but never scale up to the type or make the type of change that we all aspire to. Then there's financial issues. Uh, as only, only too well knows, the Pell Grants at one time in the 1980s covered nearly 75 to 80% of a four-year college degree. Today, what is it, Arnie, 35% at most? Yeah, yeah. a little less, a little less. Even less. So that students who have to make up academic skills often have to use their Pell Grants for courses that do not carry college credit. 
and in turn, they're unable to finish. So we have to provide resources not only to institutions, but also to the students to make their degree possible. Uh, and then the question of scale. Uh, I don't understand how any college, especially two-year colleges, uh, that have been de-invested by the public. It's surprising to me how you can call an institution public and have the public de-invest itself of it. Um, will have the resources to bring it to scale. And therefore, there's increasing concern by foundations like Lumina, Ford Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to invest in ways that lead to sustainable, scalable change, and in turn, use intelligently technology to help us do so. Those are the things we must address soon. Great, thank you. And, you know, I think it's important for us to understand the challenges, but it's also important to celebrate the successes in terms of the kind of gains that we've seen locally and nationally um, in college access and attainment for disadvantaged students. And I think to unpack this a little bit, we're gonna start with the K-12 education system first and then shift to higher ed because this is actually a problem um, and an opportunity that spans these two really distinct universes, these different galaxies in some senses. So let's start with the K-12 system successes and Liz and Arnie, I'm going, going to refer to you on this since you have experience in this arena and, and Liz, starting with you. Um, can you talk about a key success or a couple of key successes that we've had in Chicago public schools in your experience um, in regards to this issue of attainment access and graduation relative to the students that we serve. What have we done well and what have we learned from our successes? Well, if you look at um, the four-year college enrollment rate um, in Chicago Public Schools in 2006, it was about 31%. Um, and the national rate was about uh, 41, 42%. Um, in 2013, the CPS rate grew to um, 42% and um, the national rate stayed relatively flat. So we see really great gains um, happening in enrollment and, enrollment and also completion in CPS, though not as aggressively um, as it relates to, to college access, but also college completion. And I have to say that the district is um, aggressively focusing resources and structures in order to really move this needle. So um, we're, our goal is beyond students completing high school. Our, our goal really is students also Attaining, um, attaining a degree. And so there are structures that we have in place that really push this. Um, we've increased the number of students that have access to uh, programs like IB, AP, um, early college credit attainment. Um, the speaker mentioned the College Bridge program. We're really seeking to expand that to students because research shows that that exposure assists students in completing college. That early, that early exposure is so valuable for them in terms of completion. Even if students don't necessarily score high on, on AP tests, for example, just that exposure really helps students to be more prepared for success. Um, we've also, though, um, added an accountability measure to high schools, um, which I think has been um, really a huge shift in what schools are now uh, focusing on. So for example, uh, schools, a part of the rating for schools is the number of students that um, enroll in college. But not only who enrolls in college, but who is persisting the next year, who remains in school. Um, schools are also rated based upon the number of students that have exposure to early college courses, um, AP courses, and IB courses as well. So this is really um, shifting how schools are thinking about how do they support students from the time they enter high school mm -hmm. such that they really are able to develop academic profiles that will open them up to a wide variety of opportunities that they can um, apply to as seniors. So that's been really tremendous. And then coupled with that, there are um, just tremendous supports that are happening to drive this work because we know that we can't just tell a student, we expect for you to go to college without putting things in place to help them get there. So for example, um, there is a new college, credential, college credentialing program for, um, for school counselors where counselors are able to deepen their knowledge around 
uh, the, college, uh, the college application process, college advising process, so that they really are guiding students towards best fit schools uh, for them. Um, we have a specific focus and push on FAFSA completion. Uh, that comes out of the research from the Consortium on Chicago School Research, uh, which revealed the importance of the FAFSA in terms of college access. So that's something um, that schools uh, look at you know, weekly and really set goals around completing so that students um, specifically low-income students who really need those, those, state, those state and federal monies have access to those. So there's a plethora of things that, uh, structures that we have in place to support students really um, arriving to their senior year with a variety, of, a variety of options. So it sounds like this is a combination of structural supports, mm. but what you opened with is opening up the idea that aspiring to college is what we want for our students and that belief being foundational with the structures and supports wrapped around it. So talk about this a little bit from the federal level, Arnie. Um, and you made so many courageous moves you know, relative to the use of federal funds and, and federal policy. What do you think are some of the successes in terms of this issue around attainment? and uh, access. So I'm much more focused on where we need to go than past successes, <laughs> but a couple things. We, we worked hard to simplify the, the FAFSA form. The form itself was a huge barrier to entry and went from about an hour and a half on average to about 28, 29 minutes. Now we still need to get it simpler, <laughs> uh, but you can't have the form that unlocks billions of dollars of financial aid be the thing that prevents kids from going to college. So that was a good step in the right direction. One of the things I'm most proud of is we were able to get an additional $40 billion for Pell Grants. We stopped subsidizing banks to make loans. We made loans ourselves. That was wildly controversial in Washington. We thought it was common sense. And got $40 billion without going back to taxpayers for a nickel. We went from 6 million Pell recipients to 9 million, a 50% increase, many for the minority community, many first generation. And then we put a huge focus on increasing high school graduation rates and reducing dropout rates. And over the past couple of years, we've seen the nation's high school graduation rate hit all-time highs. Every subgroup, white, black, Latino, Native American, poor English language learners. Every group is getting better. Dropout rates are down. Uh, black dropout rates down 45%. Hispanic dropout rates cut in half from 28 to 14%. With higher high school graduation rates and lower dropout rates, that's led since 2008 to an additional 1.1 students of color enrolling in college. Now that's a good step in the right direction. The goal is not enrollment, the goal is completion. And that's a, you know, we still have to see how that plays out. But you know, making the form simpler, getting a lot more money to students, and then driving up the number of students from the minority community going to college are things that I think directionally move, moved, it, moved the ball in the right direction. That's great, and so we, get a, we got a picture here then of what this looks like on the ground in a school district in a city like Chicago and the kind of supports and structures we need to put into place. And then this overlay the, of the federal government structure around policy and funding um, as supports. And so shifting then, to the higher education side of this, and, and for this question, I'm, I'm going to rely on Vince and Arnie to, to respond to, um, about what are the kind of key levers relative to the higher education side of this equation. So, you know, we have the Chicago Public Schools and other districts throughout the country um, pushing more students, supporting them, helping them to aspire to college, giving them the supports they need, the FAFSA, all of these pieces. Once they land on campus, what are the key levers, Vince, to keep them there? Well, for the institutions, it's being committed. <laughs> or, or sometimes we say uh, student success does not arise by chance. When you look at these institutions like Florida State, even my own institution, Syracuse, um, it's clear that they have a clear intentional goal. Uh, they know how to measure that goal and they assess it as a guide to their continuing behaviors. They structure their activities around an organized form of activity that brings together people from all over the campus to the same end. And they invest heavily in that goal. Uh, and they bear the fact that it takes time to achieve these ends. They don't give up too early. So institutions have done that. Uh, but what we've learned from it, they don't play at the margins. They understand there has to be major structural change in how the colleges are organized and how they deliver their services. So what we're now seeing, for instance, the recently announced uh, $3 million grant from the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the USA funds to the American Association of State Colleges and Universities that will bring together 44 institutions across the nation to completely redesign the entire first year of college with the explicit goal of improving success of especially low-income and underserved students. They are taking it seriously. 
And in that um, movement, I like to just observe the one place that we haven't yet talked about fully is the role of the classroom in student retention and learning, since the object of retention is learning, not just completion. The fact is most low-income students work, then many go part-time, they don't live on campus, unlike the fortunate students here, and that means they often come to the campus, go to class, and when class is over, they leave, take care of the families, do work. And if they're not being helped in the classroom, if they're not being engaged and supported in the classroom, it's very hard for them to succeed in any way. And therefore, we have to not only restructure the first year, we also have to think of how we restructure the first year classrooms and recognize that our faculty in higher education are key players in this initiative because they are the ones who control the classroom, establish the conditions for classrooms. And yet the irony of these folks, and I'll speak for myself because I have a degree from this wonderful university many years ago, we in academic work are the only faculty from elementary school to middle school to high school who are literally not trained to teach our own students, nonetheless to help them learn. And I would like to argue that must change. We must ensure that all our faculty are given the opportunity to develop the skills they need to help their students learn. If we don't do that, we still haven't really addressed the problem. Very good. And but I might observe I'm the exception. I'm a talented faculty member. <laughs> I could hear the students wanted to get that round of applause and so we had to, to make space for that. So Arnie, going to you on the, the federal level, both this issue around federal policy, federal funding to support the higher education side of this equation, but also thinking about bridging that K-12 education, higher education divide. So three, at least three huge challenges that are still, we have not solved, a long way to go. Um, one is the huge need for remediation in college. Mm -hmm. And while higher ed can do a better job there, we ultimately have to get higher ed out of that business. And the fact that so many states have low standards, low expectations, lack of rigor, K to 12, is devastating. Just one quick stat, Massachusetts is by far our highest performing state on virtually every measure. And in the state of Massachusetts, 30% of their high school graduates, not their dropouts, 30% of their high school graduates have to take remedial classes and once they go to college, two and four year. And that's state number one. Think about two through 50. And so this is you know, political pushback from the far left and the far right, but I would challenge anyone to say that having low standards, low expectations is good for anybody. Many states have moved forward with courage. It's harder to teach those standards. We've got to support teachers. We've got to explain them to parents and students, but we have to get away from low expectations. That's one. Secondly, we at the federal, federal level, I think are a huge part of the problem, frankly. We fund higher education through all of your generosity as taxpayers, $150 billion each year in grants and loans. But all of our money going to higher ed is based upon inputs. It's based upon enrollment. It's yeah. not based upon outcomes. And we have worked very hard and there's lots of pushback, but we should be incentivizing universities to take more African American and Native American and Latino students. We should be incentivizing them to take more first generation college goers and more Pell Grant recipients. And not just to accept them, but to provide the supports to help them cross that stage four or five years later. And the fact that we don't provide any financial incentives for good behavior, and we don't take money away from universities that show very little interest and commitment to completion, we are a huge part of the problem. Vince wants to inject something. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Oni. This, we now have, number, half of the states in the United States have what's called performance-based funding for colleges, which to some degree give incentive for increasing graduation rates. What we need to have that be focused on increasing the graduation rates of low-income and underserved students Otherwise, it will not work. Right, right. It's got to be a degree of difficulty. Absolutely. I would just add, just to put in context, those performance-based funding models usually only you know, account for a very small percentage, 5% or 10%, right, at the state level. So it's not actually moving to a fully performance-based model. It's a tiny sliver yeah. of funding. So I go back to, if we're trying to get radically better, we can't play on the margins. And the yep. fact that we're barely playing on the margins means to me we're not in the game we need mm -hmm. to be. In the final piece, I blame, frankly, all of us as voters that I always say budgets reflect our values. And many, many states are increasing their budgets for incarceration 
and many, many states are reducing their funding to higher education, and K-12, and early childhood for that matter. So th that is why, to Vince's point, the Pell Grant is such a small percent of the overall tuition, because tuition is going up and subsidies from states are going down. And again, to be very clear, I don't blame politicians. I blame all of us, Democrat, Republican, I care less, as voters, that we allow politicians to put significant new resources each year into locking people up at forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars per year, and we don't elect folks from either party who actually want to invest in making college more affordable. I think that's a really important point in this. And, and so just to the second part of the question, Arnie, about the K-12 higher education link. You know, one of the gaps that we have is that for a long time, high school accountability has been based on high school graduation, not focused on college at all. Um, and higher education sometimes has a tendency to point to K-12 and say, look, you, you send us all these unprepared students. Um, and so what is it that we can do to make those two entities work together? Well, I think, you know, so much of what you're trying to do here, the leadership of Liz and others in the university, I think is absolutely going on in the right direction. So having part of the accountability for high schools be not college going, but college uh, uh, pers pers persistence, perseverance, taking those college level classes. If you're taking college classes as a junior, senior, that just doesn't help you academically, educationally, psychologically, you start to believe you can go to college and be successful. So I think that's huge what they're doing. Um, I love the scholarships to the University of Chicago here. The Honestly, what I think is probably more important is the Collegiate Scholars Program, because that's the university not being... <laughs> Because that's the university thinking very unselfishly that, again, we got this extraordinary talent across Chicago. They can't all come to the University of Chicago, but they can go to good colleges and be successful. So that's the university reaching down. It's K-12 reaching up, meeting the middle. There's real power there. So I'm actually very encouraged by what folks are trying to do. Did you want to add something, Vince? So, so we're getting close to our Q&A, and I want to make sure we don't shortchange that. Um, but before we do, I think it's important for us to talk about the reasons why we're hopeful in this work. I know all of us um, working in this field, there are a lot of challenges, especially right now currently in, in the state of Illinois and in our city, you know, relative to the funding challenges, um, to the, the challenges that we face, that our most disadvantaged students face uh, relative to reaching this benchmark that we know they, that we can reach. We know they can get there if we just give them the access and the opportunity. But what are some reasons to be hopeful um, in your work? And, and why don't we start with you, Vince, and, and tell us what the reasons that you feel hopeful um, about access and attainment. Well, I think we have now more than a number of examples of institutions that have made the difference. We have examples that people can learn from. It's not just a matter of research literature or opinion articles. We see real progress. And should performance-based funding be revised as it will, there will be consequence. And institutions respond to consequence. And I think we as a society are increasingly clear that we can no longer tolerate this continuing and expanding divide that undermines our future as a society. Because these students that we're talking about two-year schools, four-year schools, they are our future. Unless we help them, our future is in threat. Go ahead, please. You know, um, one thing that gives me hope um, for Chicago Public Schools in particular um, is the success that we've experienced with On Track. Um, we're at this point about um, 84, 85% of our students on track, rising uh, graduation rates. If we can take um, those same structures um, and supports and apply that to the B's or better work and increasing grade point averages, I'm convinced that we're going to have a larger pool of students that are, um, that are eligible for great opportunities and great scholarship opportunities. But in, in addition, um, we do see work happening in schools in Illinois where colleges are coming together and they're really trying to solve this problem around uh, retention and completion. Um, I think there are certainly pressures to do that, but we're starting to see shifts in what's happening in the freshman year and people thinking about how they can really connect students to strong experiences to keep them connected into schools. Um, and then finally, when we look at um, the work that we're doing as a district around high school, we have um, a renewed focus on high school work um, that looks at what's happening in terms of curriculum, what's happening in terms of student supports, um, and how we can leverage the power of partnerships to really um, assist students in having successful high school experiences that lead to successful college experiences as well. Right. 
Arnie. Uh, I, I think a lot about movements, and I think we need a movement here. Again, we don't need minor change. This really is a social movement. I think a lot about the civil rights movements and others. And the reason I'm hopeful, and this is sometimes tough on college presidents and administrators, but national study came out, we're seeing it, that freshmen now, freshmen on college campuses, are more politically active than they have been in decades. And we need that energy. We need that idealism. We need young people pushing all of us as adults to behave in very different ways. And I honestly think that in many ways we as adults have failed young people and we need young people themselves to step up and to have voice and to challenge us to do more and meet them halfway. And we're seeing that. We're not seeing apathy. We're seeing students stepping up and being part of the solution. I think that's very, very positive. And I would just add to that my, my own reason that I'm hopeful, and it has to do with um, the students that are in this room, is I think of what I've seen over the past 20 years, or really especially over the past 10 years that I've been in this field, is the incredible talent that's going into the field of education today. And I think one of the things that's changed um, for you students is that this is no longer a field in which only education majors or people formally trained in education are participating. There are MBAs and PhDs in anthropology and um, you know, people with economics backgrounds and every background you can imagine contributing to this field. And we need your diverse talents as teachers and policy experts, um, as researchers and policy makers. And so I just encourage you to bring your talents to bear on this field because we desperately need you. And with that, we'll be transitioning to the question and answer uh, part of the panel and you'll be able to ask your questions of the panelists. Sometimes when low income students are coming into university environments, they face barriers that aren't academic and aren't just based on support, but they're a result of other issues that may present themselves while in the course of their time at universities. Uh, what other supports do you think can be made available to students, such as support in case a student may need to take time off, perhaps part-time, things like that, because sometimes you can be extremely intelligent, but not perhaps able to go at the same speed as other students? Well, I think you're asking about other supports. Well, the, the work of Claude Steele has often referred to his notion of stereotype threat, mm -hmm. uh, which has been well documented, not just for African American students, but for women in science, uh, that many students come in uh, believing or doubting their capacity to succeed. And with good reason, if you will, because their past experience does not support that notion they've been successful. So when you admit a student, it's not just enough to give them academic support. Be very sensitive to the need to get social support that says we believe you can succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, the saying, no one rises to low expectations. But in too many institutions, that's just the case. So students need, just need also support, especially in terms of mentoring and role models. Many of them did not have role models in their prior experience. To come to a college where someone can say to them, if I've made it here, so can you. Those things matter for students in addition to academic help. And I would just add to that, and speaking from the perspective of the University Charter School, uh, which the Urban Education Institute runs, um, and the, the past four years, 100% of our high school seniors at our non-selective um, charter school that, that serves the south side of Chicago have been admitted to college. And one of the things we do is we continue to support them um, once they land, wherever they land in college. Uh, we provide them with essentially a 13th year counselor um, who is, is actually following them. Uh, one of our, our chief alumni officer actually visits every single one of our graduates on their mm. campuses. He goes on a road trip all over. Most of our students are in Illinois universities and visits them. And so I think that's, that's one piece of support, this kind of institutional support that can high schools see this as part of their responsibility in some respects to provide supports. But one of the things I've seen be powerful is I think the peer supports are incredibly important um, for students. And so one of the things we've tried to do is actually place our students, almost the Posse Scholar model where they're placed in clusters and groups of them are going to institutions. So for instance, we have 22 students at Mizzou. We've had uh, 10 go to Oberlin. And in those kinds of instances, you have a person who's a senior who graduated from your high school when you get there as a freshman and they can kind of show you the ropes on campus. And so I think this combination of 
the institutional supports that can high schools provide part of that, um, and then the peer network on campus seem to be important additions to that as well. And then may I just add, that can also happen in the classrooms. A number of years ago, we did a study of 22 universities and colleges that had learning communities in the first year, all of them using some form of collaborative or cooperative teaching techniques, problem-based learning, project-based learning. Uh, and a number of students told us uh, the same story. For them, this shared journey with other students was like a raft running the rapids of their life. And that without that sh shared support constructed in the classroom or in a program, it was very hard to make it on their own. So support really does matter. I couldn't agree more. Uh, my question goes to something that uh, Secretary Duncan mentioned about prison and education. Um, I did my taxes last year, Secretary, I mean last week, and um, the young man that Liz spent five years helping to educate is now in college, and there is one question that I have to answer, and I'm glad I'm able to answer yes. Um, has he been convicted of a felony? And as we talk about financial aid, if I had to answer that question no, that would kill any conversation in terms of financial aid. As we talk about banning the box when it comes to employment, what efforts were being made to ban the box when it comes to financial aid on your federal income tax forms? Yeah. Hmm. It's, a, it's a great question. And th this, you know, these are lengthy conversations, but the school to prison pipeline issue is real. And I, I learned a lot in DC, but I was stunned as it started in pre-K that across the nation we had schools suspending and expelling three and four year olds <laughs> from pre-K. And guess what, the overwhelming majority were young boys of color. I had no idea, it just blew me away. It was a punch in the gut. And we challenged that very hard, but just to be clear, it doesn't start at 17, 18, 19, it literally across the country starts with our three and four year old young boys of color. And we have to be honest as educators and look in the mirror and say, are we exacerbating the problem? Are we perpetuating it? Are we doing something different? To go specifically to your question, whether it's around employment opportunities, what's employment opportunities at the federal level, well, it's opportunities for financial aid, banning the box is absolutely the right direction to go, and folks will continue to push very, very hard to get there. We have to have a nation of second chances. We have to give people a second chance. And uh, many young men in prison are doing extraordinary things to change their lives. One small thing we did is we, start, we put in place a pilot program called Second Chance Pell, starting to provide Pell grants to folks that are incarcerated. Um, Congress won't allow us to do it at scale, so we were able to do it through an experimental site. But that's the kind of thinking we need to do. And talk about optimism, I'm actually hopeful, but again, the, the cost of education is so much cheaper than the cost of incarceration. This is actually one of the few places where hard left and hard right can come together. Liberals think it's the right thing to do. Far right thinks it helps to save taxpayer money. Both are true. And so there, I think there's a real opportunity going forward um, to try and work on this stuff together. Um, I don't have a lot in common with the Koch brothers, but their general counsel is a huge proponent of these kinds of things. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Do I see another hand for a question on the second row here? Yeah, hi, I, I have a question on the uh, um, teachers. And for example, you know, in this great university, uh, the student uh, benefit a lot because of the quality of the faculty. And, uh, and similarly, the argument could be extended to the K-12 education, particularly in the high school. And I myself you know, teach a class for the Chicago Collegiate uh, Program. And, and I think the program has very you know, fantastic faculty. So that, you know, we, we I, I, like Ani said, you know, I, I think we can reach down and do a lot. So I want to ask the question, are there thoughts on expanding the quality of the teaching in the K-12 education so that we can really, truly do, a, do it big? Yeah, I think um, both locally and nationally, a lot of work is being done around teacher effectiveness in particular. Um, and we see teacher evaluation, evaluation systems changing to really reflect um, the, the quality of teaching um, and, and the, 
the types of um, planning and execution moves that teachers need to make in order to be effective with students in particular. Um, it is, it's a complex task because as you, as you well know, teaching is complex. Um, you know, if when we look at recent reports on the REACH evaluation as a system in Chicago public schools, um, we, tend, we tend to see um, that students that are in um, low-income neighborhoods, um, their REACH scores for those teachers in particular tend to be lower. Um, and the challenge of that is it, it creates a disincentive um, for, for teachers to go to schools that have needs for quality teachers in particular. So it's a, it's a problem that we're wrestling with um, and we're really you know, relying on the research to drive us forward as, in terms of, of policy implications. Um, I also think that um, the new Common Core State Standards mm. um, are really going to um, better prepare students for success in high school. They are much more rigorous. Um, and they also, um, I think, will push the practice of teachers in particular. So um, that is something that I'm hopeful of, even though I know they're controversial. There may be you know, many states that want to opt out. Um, I firmly believe that um, a strong implementation of those standards is going to lead to students um, who are ready to be even more successful um, in college. I would just add one more, I think, complexity to this. Um, that sometimes gets missed, but it's really important, is teacher turnover and teacher attrition, mm. which makes the teacher quality a question very complicated. Uh, so if you talk about the context of looking across the nation and 50% of teachers are leaving the profession in five years, and you look in the context that Liz is talking about in the most disadvantaged schools, and you could have an 80% turnover rate in three years, then this question of quality becomes really, really complicated because it isn't just about picking the right people on the front end and developing them and supporting them well. We need to do that. But it's also very difficult to do that in a context of this constant turnover um, of the workforce, and especially so in the highest need schools. So one of the things that we know from research is that the students who need high quality teaching the most are the least likely to get it. So we know this high quality teaching matters but we also have this high turnover rate and this mismatch between the level of student need and the quality of teaching. And so I think all of that makes this very much a moving, a moving target and makes this developmental aspect that Liz is talking about um, really, really important. And I can't say enough on the front end of teacher preparation, of recruitment into these programs and the preparation they get as another important lever in this. Let me just to be a little provocative on it, because it's not just bringing teacher talent in in mass, which we need to do, and we can work on that. It's again, to your point, getting the hardest working and most successful teachers and principals to the most underserved communities, be it inner city Chicago or rural America on Native American reservations. And one of the theories of local control in American public education, 15,000 school districts give you lots of innovation. My challenge is out of 15,000 school districts, there is not one, there is not a single district that systemically, systematically identifies their hardest working, their most successful teachers and principals, and places them in the most underserved communities. And so again, we as adults lack courage. Chicago is a huge city. Teaching at Harper High School or in Englewood is very different than teaching at Walter Payton and Northside College Prep. It is all difficult, but there is a degree of difficulty that's exponential as a teacher, as a social worker, as a counselor. And the fact that we don't compensate differently, support differently, reward differently, ensures that the kids who need the most get the least. We talk about college access and attainment, and I guess the question is for what? So I guess I'm assuming that's for uh, career and employment opportunities. If we agree on that, can you talk a little bit about what role do you see employers playing in the education journey of our students for their success, both with collaboration with educators, making sure that um, education is aligned with the needs of employers, as well as maybe providing students work-based opportunities throughout their career. Well, the, um, you know, in this current conversation about the need to make our college education occupational relevant, people overlook the fact that uh, over half the people who finish in a given major don't work in that major. Mm. <laughs> I have an advanced degree in physics. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> Much to the uh, benefit of science, I'm no longer in physics. <laughs> uh, I think what employers need and don't often get is the general critical thinking skills mm -hmm. 
skills that allow students to work with other people in a collaborative way in diverse environments. And they can build upon with specific skills for that particular occupation. So we have to find a balance, I think, between those sort of important critical skills that all students need regardless of where they work and the work of employers to give students experiences to learn the skills they need for specific occupational training. Uh, we shouldn't go too down, far down that path of occupational relevance too quickly in my view. But occupational uh, employers can do much during summer internships through grants for low income students to work with them so they can develop skills specific to an occupation that they will in fact be employed in. And we have examples now of um, employers partnering with high schools um, in order to provide students access to work-based opportunities to, to drive their um, interest and enthusiasm in particular fields and also to assist with access. So for example, um, we have a high school in the Southwest side, Good STEM Academy, that partners with IBM. And uh, not only do they provide students exposure to um, the technical fields um, in IBM, but they also assist students in um, graduating from high school with not only a high school diploma, but also an associate's degree. Mm. So we're starting to see the, those type of partnerships, not only in Chicago, but also across the country as well, being driven by the employer's need to, to fill particular positions um, in, their companies, in their companies as well. We have you know, five or six similar partnerships at high schools across the city, so I think that's one promising practice that could address that connection between employers um, and college enrollment. If I just want to start out by thanking you, the audience, for um, being a part of this, engaging in this critical conversation about access and attainment um, and being a part of this discussion. I want to extend again a special thanks to Sir Michael Moritz and Harriet Heyman for your incredible contribution um, uh, to the University of Chicago and to the Odyssey Scholarship Program. I also would like to acknowledge, again, the many Odyssey students that are in the audience. Could you stand up and be recognized, please? Please know that you inspire the efforts that are underway here to broaden access to college education um, with your lived experience, so thank you so much for that. Um, with that, we would like to close the panel portion and this formal presentation, but we would invite you to stay and join in the reception um, out in the Hutchins Common area, and thank you very much for being here with us this evening. <laughs>